minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. There are few disciplines more revered in modern society than rocket science. We put rocketry on a pedestal as this kind of unknowable alchemy. Science and engineering are converted into raw power that can lift skyscrapers into the upper reaches of our atmosphere and break free from the limitations of the Earth, expanding humanity into the great vastness of outer space. In the brief history of human spaceflight, there have been few rocket engines as iconic and significant as the RS-25, probably better known as the Space Shuttle main engine. This was a major leap forward in rocket science that powered three decades of NASA expansion into low Earth orbit. And now, five decades after its inception, the RS-25 is back again at the heart of NASA's SLS rocket and their new mission to establish a permanent presence on the moon. This is a rocket engine steeped in a tumultuous history. It's seen a lot over the years, and there is so much more to come for the RS-25. This is the Space Race. The Space Shuttle program and the engines that would power it were born of the unbridled optimism that surrounded NASA in the late 1960s. If we could put a man on the moon, then obviously we can do anything. The Jetsons, Star Trek, the future was within our grasp. Everyone knew that the 21st century would be humanity's space age. The next generation of human spaceflight required the next generation of rocket technology. The F-1 engines that powered the Apollo-era Saturn V were incredible for their raw power, but they came at the cost of being absolutely humongous and relatively inefficient. For their new engine design, NASA demanded not only maximum thrust, but also maximum efficiency, and with the added curveball of reusability. Every F-1 engine ever flown was entombed at the bottom of the ocean, so it didn't matter if they were serviceable or not. But NASA's dream for the future was a fleet of rocket-powered space planes that would return to the Earth to be quickly reloaded and flown again. The idea was to get the cost per launch and cost per pound sent to orbit as low as possible. There were a lot of concept designs for the space shuttle back in the day. My favorite is the dual rocket plane idea that would have one giant booster aircraft for liftoff that would carry the orbiter through the atmosphere on its back. The booster stage would be larger than a Boeing 747 and be powered by 12 of the new liquid-fueled rocket engines. Then, post-separation, the booster would be manually flown back down to the ground like an airplane while the orbiter would go on to function basically the same way as the real space shuttle did. It would have been a fully reusable orbital launch system that would be spectacularly cheap to operate over the long run. Unfortunately, there would be a steep initial cost with this design, advanced materials and manufacturing techniques would have to be invented from scratch. The deeper that NASA went into the space shuttle development, the more that their expectations had to be brought back down to Earth. The issue was that following the Apollo missions dragging on into the 1970s, general interest in space programs faded, and the political will to continue a lot of spending on non-military space programs just didn't really exist anymore. It's amazing how quickly human beings can get bored of genuinely amazing things. I don't know what's up with that. Anyway, in order to justify the continuation of any shuttle program at all, it meant serious cutbacks and concessions, particularly to the Air Force, who demanded the spacecraft be capable of lifting their heavy defense satellites to high altitudes. This is how we ended up with the space shuttle design that we all know today. It became a hybrid of reusable and disposable technology. The next generation liquid-fueled rocket engines still had their part to play in pushing the shuttle to orbital velocity, but the heavy lifting through the lower atmosphere would now be handled by two solid rocket boosters. The entire system would be strapped to a giant disposable fuel tank. This was far from the best way to build the space shuttle, but it had such a low barrier to entry and initial startup cost that NASA had really no choice but to go this route. So while the overall design of the shuttle was largely dumbed down for cost saving, 
the liquid-fueled main engine was still allowed to thrive as a major advancement in rocket technology. The NASA design contract for the space shuttle main engine was awarded to a company called Rocketdyne. They had also developed the F-1 main engine for the Saturn V, as well as the J-2 upper stage engine. On the Saturn V, the main fuel source for the booster stage was RP-1, essentially purified kerosene, and that's combined with cryogenic liquid oxygen. For the upper stage, the rocket switched over to cryogenic liquid hydrogen fuel in combination with the oxidizer. For the space shuttle, Rocketdyne wanted to ditch the RP-1 and use hydrogen as the primary fuel source at liftoff. This would contribute greatly to achieving the three main goals of maximizing power, efficiency, and longevity for the new engine. Hydrogen has a lot of advantages as a rocket fuel. For one, it's the lightest element in the known universe, so that's an obvious win for increasing the thrust to weight ratio. Hydrogen also has a highly efficient and intense combustion that makes it an ideal rocket fuel. In addition, the only residual byproduct of burning hydrogen is just water vapor, and that's important for making an engine that would be rapidly reusable. Burning RP-1 leaves behind a carbon residue that clings to the internal components. It's called coking. That means that the entire engine needs to be scrubbed down before it can be used again. It's not that you can't have a reusable engine with RP-1. SpaceX does it with the Falcon 9, but it's not ideal. Now, that's not to say hydrogen doesn't come with its own challenges. To maintain a liquid state, it needs to be stored below negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And since hydrogen is the smallest, lightest molecule in existence, it has a tendency to leak. This stuff will escape through any avenue, even the slightest fault in any seal. Hydrogen atoms can even move through solid metal given enough time. In addition to their fuel source, Rocketdyne increased the efficiency of the RS-25 by introducing a closed cycle gas generator, also known as a staged combustion cycle. For the F1 engine, the engineers had created an open cycle gas generator to drive the main turbo pumps that send the fuel and oxygen into the combustion chamber. A gas generator is kind of like a little miniature rocket engine within the main engine. The high pressure exhaust gas generated by this mini engine is used to spin a turbine that in turn spins the main fuel pumps. After doing its job, the exhaust from the gas generator is then dumped out of the system. This is an open cycle engine, and this is where we get into the F1 being relatively inefficient, because all of the energy from the gas generator is simply dumped overboard. You can squeeze more performance out of an engine by containing that exhaust and making it continue to perform work. Hence, closed cycle or staged combustion. So. Now what you have instead of a gas generator is a pre-burner, some basic idea, but now the exhaust from that mini rocket engine that powers the turbine will be channeled directly into the main combustion chamber. The RS-25 runs the pre-burner on the fuel side of the engine, burning mostly hydrogen with just enough oxidizer mixed in to allow for combustion. This keeps the temperature as low as possible. If you do it the other way around and run an oxygen-rich pre-burner, then you end up with extreme heat that is very difficult to manage. So a fuel-rich closed cycle is ideal, but again, this is only really possible with hydrogen or methane, but that would be several decades away. If you try and do this with RP-1, the soot will just clog the whole thing up and the engine will die. So there are two pre-burners on the RS-25, one for the oxygen pump and one for the fuel pump. And the fuel-rich exhaust from the pre-burners is then sent directly into the combustion chamber along with pure hydrogen and oxygen. This makes for an extremely high pressure in the main chamber, which in turn generates a high level of thrust relative to the size of the engine. In order to compensate for the increased chamber pressure of over 3000 PSI, Rocketdyne had to develop their own copper zirconium alloy. It took the company the better part of a decade to perfect the RS-25. Designing a rocket engine is one thing, learning how to get it started without blowing up and then keeping it burning throughout the entire eight and a half minute flight plan is a whole other thing, just ask the Starship. What they ended up with was a spectacularly reliable rocket engine. Each RS-25 had a projected lifespan of over 50 orbital missions. In total, there were 46 engines built for the space shuttle program and out of 135 total launches, 
there was only ever one single RS-25 failure in flight, and the shuttle still made it safely to orbit. In many ways, the engine was a phenomenal success. But there were still some downsides. For one, the hydrogen fuel would prove to be an ongoing difficulty for NASA, with many shuttle launches over the years being scrubbed on the pad due to a hydrogen leak. Beyond that, the rapid reusability and economy of the RS-25 never really panned out. The cost associated with refurbishing the engines between flights was so high that they were never really any cheaper than a single-use expendable booster. And the low production volume of the shuttle's disposable fuel tanks held the vehicle back from ever being flown as regularly as it was originally intended. So, at the end of the shuttle program, NASA found themselves with a remaining stockpile of RS-25s that were still perfectly good for spaceflight, engines just waiting on a rocket. And that rocket would be the Space Launch System, NASA's 21st century return to the moon. Again, the solid-fueled side boosters would be mostly responsible for getting SLS off the ground, but four RS-25s would carry on the final push towards a translunar injection orbit for the Orion spacecraft. The Artemis program will burn through NASA's remaining 16 RS-25 engines, assuming they're all cleared for flight, that will take us up to Artemis 8 sometime in the mid-2030s. Following that, the RS-25 will live on. NASA has already ordered the restart of engine production at Rocketdyne, now merged with Aerojet to form the coolest name in the industry, Aerojet Rocketdyne. The new RS-25 will not have to be optimized for reusability or longevity, so these will be much easier and cheaper to produce, the design will be more simplified, and even more power can be squeezed out. At that rate, it wouldn't be surprising to see the RS-25 continue its service well into the 21st century. We could even see 100 years of operation from that original engine design. It's easily one that should rank among the greatest inventions in humanity's long history of making cool stuff. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.